Hey everyone, me again, Laszlo Montgomery. Another China History Podcast coming to you exclusively from the ChinaHistoryPodcast.com. You might want to go plug in a humidifier or something. Today's subject is, I fear, a dry one. If you haven't a humidifier handy, might I suggest keeping a two-liter bottle of something cold and refreshing or perhaps some moisturizer lotion to get you through to the end of this episode. This is a dry subject, I promise you. In CHP 15, we did a 31-minute overview of the Shang. I'll rehash some of that Shang overview for this episode. What I aim to do is focus on the significance of the oracle bones themselves as a window into that embryonic Chinese world developing in Shanxi, Henan, and Shandong. So rather than asking you to go suffer through CHP 15 again, I will just give you the main points. Even for me, listening to some of those earlier podcasts gets a little painful. I hope you're liking the CHP more now. China's Bronze Age, Xia Shangzhou, all that culture we know and love today, was all incubating and evolving and getting mixed together in the lab with all these other surrounding cultures to the north, west, and south. Chinese culture, from the Han to the present day, has its roots in this cultural soup that was being cooked during China's Bronze Age. The Xia, eh, who knows if they ever existed. The Shang was still primitive by later Zhou Dynasty standards. It was the elites of Zhou society in their quest to build that perfect, harmonious China. Look to the Shang as their early influence of how the kingdom's political organization should be set up. Back in episode 15, I gave you the general overview of the Shang and how the bones were discovered back in 1899. Farmers had been digging up these longgu, or dragon bones, out of the ground near the Huan River and selling them to pharmacists who would grind them down for use as some poultice or another. The Huan was uh, the tributary of the Yellow River that ran through Anyang. There was already some chatter going on among some collectors who recognized the archaic forms of some recognizable characters. To date, something like 150,000 of these oracle bones and shells managed to make it down to this day and uh, were not ground up into medicine. I introduced Wang Yirong to you. He was the director of the Imperial College up in Beijing. He was either suffering from malaria or someone he knew was suffering. Whatever the case may be, he chanced upon some of these longgu, and his trained eye at once noticed something. Wang Yirong went on a treasure hunt and tracked down the source of these dragon bones to a village called Xiaotun. It was located outside of the city of Anyang in northern Henan province. By car from Beijing, this is about a six-hour drive south. You know, Wang Yirong, he was from uh, Yantai, by the way. He goes down in history as the first to recognize this script on these dragon bones as something worth studying rather than something that should be ground up into powder. He was, in his day, a well-known scholar and collector of ancient bronzes. His trained eye recognized the Jiaku Wen as soon as he saw it. But Wang came to a very untimely and tragic end. Right after he made this discovery in 1899, he somehow reluctantly got himself talked into siding with the boxers when all that stuff went down from August 1899 to September 1901. Rather than suffer the possible negative consequences of his participation on the losing side, Wang Yirong committed suicide. And as you may recall as well from that ancient episode, by 1917, the scholar poet and writer Wang Guo Wei had studied the Shang oracle bones to the extent that he was able to sort out what became known as the Shang King List. And when this list was finished and compared to the genealogy that Sima Qian wrote in the chapter called Yin Ban Ji uh, from his Shi Ji, wouldn't you know it? Exactly the same. It listed more than 30 names of kings over approximately 20 generations. This is East Asia's earliest document that can be proved to have been reliably preserved through written transmission. Wang Guowei is credited with figuring out this Shang King list, and I 
regret to say he too, like Wang Yirong, died by his own hand under similar circumstances, namely backing the losing Qing even after they were overthrown. From the discovery of these dragon bones in 1899 all the way up to 1928, there was sort of an unorganized free-for-all as anyone with a mild interest in the matter, not to mention the farmers who were spending all their time digging up anything they could find to sell to these inquiring collectors and archaeologists, no more grinding them up anymore to prepare medicine to get rid of one's aches and pains. Besides all these bones, amateur and professional archaeologists were also pulling all kinds of bronze artifacts from this site at Yinshu. From 1928 to 1937 was a more organized excavation of the site. Remember, the Japanese are going to launch their full-scale invasion of China in 1937, and that puts the old proverbial damper on the project. But before the Japanese come and ruin everything... The royal palace of the Shang kings was discovered, along with the royal tombs and dragon bones up the kazoo. And it's from these dragon bones and the inscriptions that created such a stir among scholars that they began to call this writing Jia Gu Wen, Shell Bone Script. Right now, they are the reigning champion as far as the earliest known Chinese writing. If there remains any writing that's older than this, it has yet to be discovered. Last time, we also told about how the diviners would heat these organic surfaces of these, you know, cattle scapulas and turtle plastrons and insert these hot rods or pokers into these small pits they carved into the surface. And as the laws of thermodynamics and chemistry start to take hold, these substrates would crack in certain ways from the sudden introduction of intense heat. In today's episode, let's sort of look maybe a layer or two below the headlines and perhaps appreciate more how important this first baby step was to the creation of the Chinese written language. This was a big discovery in 1899, as were the later excavation of Yinshu, the ruins of the sunken city of Yin near Anyang. Since then, as I mentioned in that episode 15, China's archaeologists have found a contemporary civilization at Sanxingdui in Sichuan, near Chengdu, but they didn't leave any written records. But at Da Xinzhuang, east of Anyang in present-day Jinan, in the Licheng district, this is in Shandong, similar artifacts to those dug up at Yinshu have been unearthed. There was plenty more than the civilization at Anyang going on in China, but so far... It was only the Shang who made their center around the present-day city of Anyang in Henan who left us any proof of their existence. Tons of stuff has been dug up in the 114 years since Wang Yirong figured out these were ancient Chinese characters from before the Zhou even. Specialists have poured over these oracle bones and the writings inscribed on all these sacrificial bronze vessels or jingwen that were cast and over the past century they slowly cracked the puzzle because i'll tell you as someone who is somewhat familiar with chinese characters i can pick out a couple jiaguwen characters but for the most part these chinese characters are as unfamiliar as egyptian hieroglyphics we also spoke of King Wu Ding's 60 consorts, one from each of the tribes surrounding his kingdom, and that Lady Fu Hao was his hands-down favorite of the bunch. Uh, also, Lady Hao is referred to by her posthumous name, Mu Xin. Last time in the Shang episode, we spoke about how her tomb was the Tutankhamun of its day. Though lacking in the kind of golden riches of the Egyptian tomb, this one dug up in late 1976, the final year of the Cultural Revolution, had been found completely intact with 1,600 kilos of bronzes contained inside. Nothing missing. Somehow by a miracle, after 3,000 years, no one, not a farmer or a grave robber, amateur archaeologist, no one had managed to stumble upon it and plunder the contents. It's not much to look at after so many years, and after all, it was still the Bronze Age in China. But the pickings that the archaeologists and historians got from the contents of this tomb, the Fu Hao Mu, were rich beyond anyone's expectations. 
Oracle bones galore, bronzes like you can't believe. Go see it at the Yinshu Museum in Anyang next time you find yourself in uh, northern Hunan. So let's focus in on some of the fine print we didn't elaborate on last time. I'm going to repeat a few things that I said before, but again, I'm just trying to spare you the agony of having to listen to one of those early China History podcast episodes a second time. You know, we throw these words around. Shang Dynasty, Oracle Bones, Dragon Bones, Oracle Bones script, Long Gu, Jia Gu, Jia Gu Wen. I think by now everyone knows. Shang Dynasty, China's first recorded dynasty, famous for the Oracle Bones, and on these bones, China's earliest writing was discovered. These are like the main bullet points. The lesser known bullet points, I don't know, maybe Lady Fu Hao, maybe her husband, the most famous and greatest of the 30 something Shang kings, Wu Ding. Anyang, Yinshu. When we talk about the Shang Dynasty, we're talking roughly 1600 to 1046 BC. Roughly 550 years, give or take. No one knows for sure when it all began. Most everything we know about the Shang, we know from these oracle bones. And of these oracle bones, pretty much all of them are from the last couple hundred years of the dynasty. And of those last couple hundred years or so, the overwhelming majority of stuff picked out of the ground comes from the time of Wu Ding and Fu Hao. That's why those two are so central to the whole story of the Oracle Bones. By reconstructing everything they could from Wu Ding's time, they were able to understand more about what came before him. The Oracle Bones only cover the period of the late Shang. This was from about Wu Ding's time in 1200 BC, all the way up to, again, the fall of the Shang in 1046 BC. Because it all began during Wu Ding's time, he gets to have the distinct honor of being the very first Chinese in recorded history who left a written record of his existence on this earth. Yellow Emperor, Fu Xi, Shun, Yu the Great, forget it. They, They were talked about, of course, but they didn't leave us anything that is in a museum somewhere that came directly from their hand. Wu Ding was first when he wrote himself into the annals of Chinese history, literally. And from Wu Ding to Di Xin, the infamous last Shang ruler immortalized with the wine pool and meat forest, the Jiu Chi Rou Lin, who could forget that one, these Shang kings consulted the spirits of their ancestors and their higher god through these oracle bones. And for the past century, we've been trying to figure out what they said. But it was thought one's ancestors, they had some pull with D. So this is why so often one would appeal to one's ancestors for guidance in one matter or another, or to perhaps use their ancestors' influence to make events or nature or whatever happen favorably for them. But as far as the lion's share of the ancient writing and all the juicy and revealing stuff, that was mostly from the time of King Wu Ding and his consort Fu Hao. Do you remember from the last episode, not only was she a great queen, but also the greatest military leader and conqueror of her day? This was 1250, 1200 BC, when Wu Ding and Fu Hao were a duo. This was the time of Theseus in Athens, Ramses three and four, the Hittites, the time of the biblical judges, a very ancient and old time indeed, the Shang Dynasty was. Keep another thing in mind about these oracle bones. They didn't reveal much about Shang society beyond what was happening in the realm of the royal palace and the life of the nobility. The peasants weren't written into the script yet. The elites of the state ran everything. You were born an elite or you weren't. It was a rigid, stratified society with craftsmen and artisans, uh, you know, an administrative hierarchy, and of course, peasants who did all the heavy lifting for public works and war, besides the workings of the royal house, the bones also gave us a peek at Shang astronomy, their calendar, climate, animals, plants, farming, place names, and adjacent powers, military expeditions, sacrifices, and religious beliefs. Besides the oracle bones, as I said, there were all these bronze sacrificial vessels, or jingwen. This was the Bronze Age, as you know, so that was the best stuff they had at the time. Not only weapons of war and housewares were cast, but all these three- and four-legged sacrificial vessels, too. They used these things for ancestral sacrifices, and most were found in burial chambers. There actually is a word for the act of applying these heated rods to bone as a 
form of divination. It's called pyromancy, or in this case, more specifically, pyroosteomancy. Pyro, of course, meaning hot or to heat, osteo, meaning bone, and mancy, meaning divination. But wait, it gets even more specific than that. Pyroosteomancy is just the general term. What the Shang Dynasty diviners practiced was called pyroscapulomancy, since the scapula of the oxen or cattle was primarily used. I mentioned they used turtle plastrons, too. The plastron is the flat part of the turtle or the tortoise, the, the, the ventral shell at the bottom, not the top rounded part of the shell. In this case, the Shang diviners practiced pyroplastromancy. This practice of divination was also found in Korea and Japan as well. All these amazing records dug out of the ground in and around Anyang, all the way east to Da Xinjuang, they all sort of went like this. Either King Wu Ding or some later Shang King himself, or maybe the equivalent of a Shang priest or diviner, would perform step one of the divining process. This actually was one of the powers that the king used to build his octoritas and dignitas among the people. That monopoly on having the power to commune with the gods and the spirits was something the Shang kings used to boost their legitimacy. Uh, just as a quick aside, there are no records that show the king ever made an incorrect prediction. Part of the reason for these divinations was to build up the king and make him look like the wise seer that he was. There's an example of an oracle bone discovered from Wu Ding's time. The inscription is a charge made by Wu Ding about a certain calamity that was coming on a certain date, which indeed happened. This artifact is a complete example of an oracle bone. It has the charge, the prognostication, and the verification all carved in one place. The characters carved into the bone are written as if this was meant to be an all-important trophy for the king to show around. Even the crevices of the characters are filled with a, a red pigment to make them stand out. So the whole process and ritual behind the oracle bones was also a great legitimizer of the king. And in a way, I guess, the earliest known Chinese propaganda on record. In this theocratic patrimonial state that the Shang was, the king at the top of the pyramid assumed the sole ability to communicate with the spirits of the dead ancestors and seek their continued blessings, which were so important to the success of the dynasty. The Shang kings held religious, political, and social power in their royal person. I just mentioned this. It all started with what was called a charge. A typical charge was, the rains will come tomorrow. Anything concerning the weather was pretty common. The divine will then works through the shaman or the king, and when the heated rod or stick is applied to the bone or shell, the organic substrate sizzles and cracks appear near where the heat is applied. Then part two of the process happens. This is the interpretation of the cracks that form, the search for hidden meaning in them. The cracks happen, and someone trained to read them will essentially say, A or nay, auspicious or not auspicious. Nothing beyond that. So now comes the final part of the process. The charge has been made, the heat is applied to the bone, and it cracks. It has been decided the crack is auspicious, and then the king gives the final say in the matter that it will rain tomorrow. Done deal. That's really all these oracle bones are. Most of these jiaku wen inscribed on these oracle bones are no more than 15 characters long. Texts of up to 30 characters have been found here and there, but only a, a few exceed 50 characters. It's interesting to note, the whole writing system developed in China as a political tool. Writing in Mesopotamia came about for economic reasons. So you're probably thinking, if that's all it is, then how do we know so much about the Shang society? Well, since Wang Yirong, there have been some very smart people working on this puzzle, and from the thousands and thousands of artifacts, they have been able to piece together a lot. And new discoveries are being made today that builds on the scholarship up till now. There weren't that many of them, but the ideal oracle bone or shell would have the date of the divination, the name of the person, the topic or charge, the interpretation of the cracks, the results, and the king's final interpretation of the cracks. The scribes carve all this info onto the bones or shells, and that's the Jaku Wen, the oracle bone inscriptions.
Wu Ding, who, by the way, Sima Qian said was the 22nd Shang King, was the most prolific of all when it came to divining. It seems he left nothing to chance, and no matter how mundane the matter, he would always consult the oracles. And not only that, he wanted the oracles to tell him the meaning behind certain events. Things would happen, and he'd want to know why. Why this crop failure? Why this natural phenomenon? Why this pestilence? So around his court, you really had to have a nice supply of oxcapulas and turtle plastrons. They had to seek divine guidance or assistance from their higher god or from their ancestors about sacrifices, rituals, sickness, childbirth, what was going to happen over the next 10-day period, you know, disasters, troubles, dreams. What did they all mean? They were constantly at war, so they always had to seek guidance regarding troop mobilizations and military campaigns. Matters regarding nature, when to go on hunting expeditions, and most importantly, anything related to agriculture, the oracle bones were always called in for that spiritual reassurance or validation. Because Wu Ding was such a major, big-time user of these things, he left us a nice record of his time in office 3,000 years ago. It's not the clearest window, but it's a window nonetheless into the daily life of the greatest of the Shang kings. Well, maybe he ties with the Shang founder, Cheng Tang. Now, I just mentioned they always carve the date into the oracle bones. Time was very important to these early Shang people, as it was to every civilization developing independently all over the world. How did they do that? It was of utmost importance when it came to consulting the oracle. Time, place, direction, they were all considered a part of the whole Shang cosmology. Well, they had a system, and I'll briefly introduce it. I was going to do an episode on this subject, but I think just a basic intro is probably all you want to know about it. Okay, here it goes. You have what's called the heavenly stems, the Tian Gan. There's ten of them. A Chinese week back in those days had ten days. So each day of the week had a stem name associated with it. We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. They had Jia, Yi, Bing, Ding, Wu, and so on, all the way up to Gui. So one of the most common of all divinations was to see what would happen in the next 10-day week ahead. Now, all students of Chinese will recognize these ten heavenly stems whenever they look at a Chinese calendar or any number of Chinese almanacs or anything related to astrology. In my daily life of living and speaking Chinese, these ten characters representing the Tian Gan, the heavenly stems, don't use them too much. They're rather obscure. But not if you're in certain professions, like law, for example. In contracts, you have the two parties, the Jia Fang and the Yi Fang. You see, all these stems were, simply put, ancient Chinese ordinal numbers. You know, ordinal numbers, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. Those are ordinal numbers in English. The ancient Chinese version of that used the ten heavenly stems. So you can imagine how important these ten characters were as far as recording history, dates, sequences of kings, or any kind of chronology. Only the Shang kings were identified by a term from these ten stems. But naming the kings posthumously using the heavenly stems is just in the Shang. Starting in the Zhou... They 86 this whole practice. The idea of using courtesy names began in the Zhou. The courtesy name would be used by one's peers, but never by the family, who would use a different name. A courtesy name, though. It wasn't a posthumous name. The ten stems first appear, yes, of course, during the time of Wu Ding, and are used to signify days of the week. Ten stems, ten days of the Chinese week. Did the Shang-era people figure this one out by themselves? Or did they receive this system from the mythical Xia Dynasty Chinese? Who knows? Then these ten heavenly stems are used in the chronology of deceased ancestors, showing who passed away and who before them and so on, all the way back to the beginning to their most ancient relative. Now you're wondering the same thing I am. If you only had ten stems, how do you get around that? And people would accumulate more than ten ancestors over time. Well, the Shang people came up with a workaround. They used these stems for their use as, you know, ordinal numbers, first, second, third, fourth. But they, they'd add an epithet or something before the stem to differentiate this deceased ancestor from, you know, another one who had the same stem name. These were 
epithets like big, greater, lesser, ancestor, middle, or, you know, whatever. Wu Ding's name itself is just the stem name Ding, the fourth of the heavenly stems, and adding the epithet Wu, the martial Wu, as in Han Wu Di. So he's Wu Ding, listed as number 27 on the Shang King list, not 22, as Sima Qian said. But there's more Dings than Wu Ding. There's also Bao Ding, the third king, Da Ding, the eighth king, Zhong Ding, the 15th, Zhu Ding, the 21st, and after Wu Ding, you still had two more Dings, Kang Ding and Wen Wu Ding. So the same stem could be used many times. Just to add something ahead of it to make it different from the next guy who was given the same stem name. These day names, as they were also called, are really archaic stuff, man. Members of the royal family, too, had these day names associated with them whenever sacrifices were involved. Now, of course, it doesn't end there. Ten characters, even back then, they must have felt this was severely limiting so they also added to the mix the earthly branches, the di jir. There were 12 of them. These 12 earthly branches were used to record time. And how were all the measurements derived from which the earthly branches were named? Why, yes, from the observations of the planet Jupiter made during the Shang Dynasty. 3,000 years ago, they figured this out. No telescopes. I mean, these ancient astronomers in China, 3,000 or more years ago, figured it out through their patient and careful observations. And they figured it out. It took the planet Jupiter just a tad under 12 years to orbit the sun. And that became their atomic clock, you know, so to speak. And they built everything on top of that 12-year foundation. So now for the grand finale. I should bang a gong to wake up anyone who is snoring by now. I'm trying to make this as interesting as I can. The punchline to all this is... You take those ten celestial stems and you combine them with those twelve earthly branches and you get the all-important sexagenary cycle, the liu shi hua jia. This is the all-important 60-day cycle. Why 60 and not 120? 60 is the least common multiple of 10 and 12. So this is what they went with. It's a cyclic, numeric system of 60 combinations of two basic cycles, the 10 heavenly stems and the 12 earthly branches. The sexagenary cycle, that's the more technical and highbrow way of saying the 60-day cycle, is central to all Chinese calendars and in Taoism, too. And because they were so important to the traditional Chinese calendar, this 60-day cycle was also used in Japan, Korea, and Vietnam as well. These were the three cultures who were closest in proximity to northern China, where the Shang and Zhou were developing. The 60 terms from the sexagenary cycle were used to record the days during the Shang. Then later on in the Zhou, they'll use this system to record the years. Nowadays, like I said, it's pretty much only used by Chinese astrologers, feng shui guys, and people in the fortune-telling business. The 12 earthly branches, they had other uses as well. They were used for giving directions. You know how in some systems, like we have in the U.S., I guess it's used everywhere, we say to a, uh, some person, is that your 3 o'clock position? Well, these 12 earthly branches were used in the same exact way. They all had a corresponding direction. With 12 possible points of direction, it was more precise than just saying, you know, north, south, east, or west. Chinese mariners stuck midpoints between the 12 directions, like we say north-northwest. You know, during the time of Zheng He's Ming Dynasty voyages in the first half of the 15th century, they added yet another midpoint to give 48 different nautical directions. We are in the middle of a sexagenary cycle right now as we speak. I bet you didn't know that. The last one began in 1984, and the next one comes in 2044. So, the all-important sexagenary cycle, ladies and gentlemen, the Ganjie, we can thank the Shang Dynasty people for that one, or should we? The state of the art and archaeological evidence shows it began with them. But again, who can say for certain? This also hadn't been handed down by the mythical Xia Dynasty civilization. A typical run-of-the-mill inscription you might find would go like this. This is a nine-character one. Jia Chen Sui Zhu Jia Yi Lao Zi Zhu. The first two characters, Jia Chen, you get your handy 
sexagenary cycle guidebook out, downloadable from many sources on the World Wide Web, and you see, aha, that is the 41st day of the 60-day cycle. And then you see further, this 41st day of the cycle is also related to yang, as opposed to yin, the wood element, and the dragon, one of the 12 animals associated with the 12 earthly branches. We won't get into that in this episode. So, this inscription, this divination, took place on the 41st day of the 60-day cycle. doesn't say the year, but these archaeologists and scientists are so smart, they figure all that out using their brilliant ways. The next character, Sui, that means sacrifice. Zhu is ancestor. There's that same Jia character again, which in this case isn't tied to the Chen character like Jia Chen. In this case, it is simply the first of the ten heavenly stems, which is the first day of the Chinese week. Yi Lao, one ox. Zi Zhu, the sun presiding. Jia Chen, Sui Zhu, Jia Yi Lao, Zi Zhu. On the 41st day of the cycle, Jia Chen, an ox, Yi Lao, was sacrificed, Sui. To the ancestor, Zhu, and the son of the king, Zi, officiated at the ceremony, Zhu. These are words speaking to us from 3,000 years ago. When it was all over for the Shang, after Di Xin breathed his last and the Ji clan established the Zhou dynasty, the center of royalty moved southwest to the city of Luoyang. This is also in Henan province. Back then, they called the city Changzhou. Some of the innovations that the Shang gave to China were kept going. Writing, for one. The Zhou Dynasty writing takes the Jia Gu Wen one or two steps further, but still, most of these characters are unrecognizable to most Chinese today. The Zhou period also saw a continuation of the Shang art of making bronzeware. Museums around the world are filled with Zhou-era bronzes. The calendar, too. The Zhou Dynasty inherited what the Shang gave them and kept that going for a while. But I'll tell you, one thing they did not adopt as a Zhou dynasty practice was pyromancy of the sort the Shang kings used. The Zhou dynasty court in Luoyang had a much better, more sophisticated and practical method to divine the favor or ill will of the gods and their ancestors. The Zhou dynasty co-founder Ji Chang, he became emperor Wen, Zhou Wenwang, and he is the one in history who has been called the author of the Yi Jing which we featured in episode CHP 97. Once the Zhou people in the first millennium BC took to the yarrow sticks and writings of the I Ching, they universally agreed. Who needs these oracle bones anymore? And that's it. No more. After the Zhou conquest around 1045, 1046 BC, the golden age of oracle bone divination came to an end. But they did keep the 60-day cycle going, the heavenly stems, the earthly branches... The Zhou took those and put their own spin on things, and then the Han did the same thing after them, you know, all the way down the line. We remember the Shang Dynasty for being the first, for the writing system they started that utilized Chinese characters rather than an alphabet. This was the system in place till about the Qin Dynasty, when the seal script came into use and things began to look like Chinese characters that even I, your humble narrator, could recognize. Being from so long ago and... You know, because of the nature of the records they left behind, it has taken the collective genius and brute force study of many scholars. It began with Wang Yi Rong, but it was the collective work of men such as Luo Chan Yu, Wang Guo Wei, all the way to Guo Mo Ruo, and everyone alive today still digging away in northern Henan to decipher all these ancient messages from China's earliest ancestors. The first Westerner to collect and study the oracle bones was Frank H. Chalfant. He lived 1862 to 1914. He was the one, in fact, who gave these dragon bones the name oracle bones. But there was one guy who stood out amongst all the early scholars of the ruins of Yin. He was a Westerner, a Canadian trained as an engineer, who came to China to carry out missionary work on behalf of the Canadian Presbyterian Church. His name was James Mellon Menzies. He lived from 1885 to 1957. In the year 1914, he found himself in and around Anyang in Henan and first encountered these bones brought to him by the locals who were constantly finding them in their fields. Over the period of the next several decades, 
Menzies became one of the leading authorities on these oracle bones and the Shang Dynasty. Almost from the get-go, he was fairly certain these bone fragments he was being handed were the key to understanding the lost Shang civilization spoken about in the records of the Grand Historian. After years of intense and careful research, Menzies produced his first of many scholarly works on the subject in 1917. Before he passed away in Toronto in 1957, James Menzies left behind an amazing archaeological collection, 50,000 fragments and a very deep body of scholarship. Back when he was in Anyang, locals knew he'd pay anything for what they dug out of the ground and that he was purely in it for the scholarship and not to, not to sell this stuff and make money. Prices for Chinese antiquities skyrocketed in the 1920s, so a lot is made about Menzi's complete devotion to studying the Shang ruins and learning all there was about this civilization from so long ago. He refused to sell his collection. He could have made a nice fortune. He used it instead in the name of academic advancement. And that was his passion. He left behind many books and scholarly papers on the subject, a giant in the field. The other thing he felt passionate about was that God had led him to these ruins at Yin and inspired him divinely to study them and reveal their secrets. The Shangdi, or the Godhead figure that the Shang rulers prayed to, the one referred to in the Oracle Bone inscriptions, was seized upon by Menzies as a possible, possible link between that Shangdi and the Judeo-Christian God. He was very convinced of this, and like the Jesuits before him, he tried to build some kind of a bridge between Christianity and Chinese religions. But, well, in the end, it didn't work out too well. <laughs> so, if you don't mind, we're going to bring this episode to a conclusion by saying that if you enjoyed this one, then for sure I have a future in this business. I have to say, I really found a lot of stuff on these oracle bones. There were a lot of interesting examples of, you know, different divinations, but for the most part, they were all in the same vein as the example I gave you. I think you got the idea. I hope you'll forgive me for sparing you all these various archaic divination texts. Fortunately, the Shang people, well, the elites anyway, left behind a whole bunch of artifacts that managed to survive to this modern day. It has been studied by the greatest minds of the past century and still today, although the quantity of artifacts recovered so far has been great. A lot of what's found is, you know, repetitive and inconclusive. Analysis that requires a thorough understanding of Jiaku Wen, China Bronze Age history, and the ancient rites is going on to this day. New stuff gets figured out all the time that adds to this incomplete history, one fact at a time. But for the most part, scholars since Wang Yirong have taken liberties with what things might have meant. Some things are certain, but a lot of what these ancient sentences say is still conjecture. I think the Sima Qian aspect of the story is still the best part. Shares in his stock skyrocketed in 1917 when Wang Guowei announced he had cracked the code of the Shang King list. If I had only bought Sima Qian shares in 1916. And of course, the story of how the oracle bones were discovered. I mean, that is, of course, unforgettable. That's it. I already have next week's topic all picked out. Amazon just dropped the book off. Take care, everyone, and I hope you're taking in all the pleasures and rejuvenation that springtime brings. I'm signing off here from lovely Claremont, California, on another one of those amazing blue sky sunny days. Going up to 23 or 24 Celsius today. I'm going to head out and take a nice walk through the mountains that, because of the recent dearth of gray-brown smog are surprisingly clear, visible, and gorgeous today. This is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you all the very best, and I hope to see you next time, perhaps, for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.